Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is August 29th, 2023, and today we are going to be covering the topic of, number one, uh, as a Mormon girl and young woman and woman, sort of the perils of ignoring your own inner voice. And I guess I'd say the upside of learning to listen to your own inner voice, that's going to be a major theme. And a second theme for today is going to be parenting after a Mormon mixed faith divorce. So, you know, you lose your faith, your partner's still a believer, you get divorced, and then you have to deal with um, how to raise your kids when two parents see the world very differently from a faith perspective. And the courageous, uh, thoughtful human that has volunteered to step <laughs> into these waters is Amy Lloyd. Hey, Amy. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Happy to be yeah. here. Yeah. And, um, you know, I sometimes find people and ask them to be interviewed, and then sometimes they write me and tell me their story. And, uh, um, and in this case... You, you used three magic words, Carolyn Pearson, which caught my attention. <laughs> but you said you kind of wanted to begin by sharing your intention for today's episode. And I will say that I'm also joined today by my lovely, brilliant partner in Righteousness and Truth, Margie. Hey, Margie. Hey. I wouldn't do this without you. Oh, Great. So, I'm excited this this for this topic today. This is going to be so, an important one. Happy to be here. Yeah, we get this topic all the time. Okay, so... Tell us your intention and hello, okay. Carolyn Pearson, and yeah, why you wanted to do this interview. Yeah, so um, it came up originally because I was visiting my mom, who's a good friend of Carolyn's, and um, they were asking me kind of about conversations I had had with my son, um, and she thought that it would be a really great topic. Um, so she reached out to you, and that's kind of why I'm here. And um, Conversations with your son. Regarding the, regarding the church um, and kind of how navigating that, which you know we'll get into later, but... I thought if it can be helpful um, to anybody else, you know, when I was kind of wrestling with this and how to deal with this and make sure that they have informed consent, make sure they know about these topics, but also be respectful because I know they're going half the time and um, all of those things. It's such a tricky space. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was navigating it blind and I didn't really find a whole lot for as helpful as I have found, you know, Mormon stories and other podcasts, which I do immensely helpful. I couldn't find anything really specifically on this topic. And um, so if I can be a helpful voice to anybody, not that I'm an expert on it by any means, I've definitely done some things that I wish I had done differently and I'm happy to share those, but I did also do some things that I'm pretty proud of. And so if I can be just a helpful, even just for other people who are in the same boat and it's helpful to just have validation that somebody else knows how hard it is. Um, that's kind of my primary intention for being here. I would say the other is there's just, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my story and to have it out there and to have it. So if, if anybody that knows me and loves me ever wants to hear my full story, it's, it's there for them to do that. So. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. We talk a lot about how Mormonism can destroy marriages when one loses their faith and the other doesn't. But we we don't talk enough about how to deal with the aftermath of that, especially right. when kids are torn between a believing parent and a non-believing parent. And I get that every week. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of amazing that you step forward to be the help instead of receive the help. Yeah. We're sorry we haven't done this more, but well, we're no. grateful that you're willing to. Yeah. And as I was kind of preparing for it, I started realizing maybe why it's not out there very much because <laughs> it is really tricky. And I want to make sure that I'm not getting into telling anyone else's story. And I want to make sure that I'm not getting into, you know, I don't want anything to be uncomfortable for anybody. And you don't so, want to trash your ex I, and no, you don't absolutely want not. And, to upset your kids. Right. Right. right? Yeah. So, and I have I've talked to them about, they know I'm coming on here by the way, but, um, yeah, it's, it is very tricky. It's yeah. very tricky. And so, um, I do want to make a small clarification that, um, me losing my faith was not what made my marriage end, but, um, yeah, I mean, we can kind of get into that, but yeah, it kind of coincided, but was not the reason mm -hmm. for it. Beautiful. So I will say that. Beautiful. All right. Well, let's jump in. And I think this is going to be in two parts. Part one is going to be, as as I mentioned, focusing on maybe ways you ignored your voice mm -hmm. as a young as a girl and a young woman, yeah. 
um, and maybe got married too quickly when you probably shouldn't have gotten married and the consequences of that. Is that right for yeah. part one? Yeah. And then part two will be how you've navigated adulting after the church and as a divorced woman and and parenting, right? Yeah. That'll be part two. Yeah, I think that sounds great. All right. So buckle in, everyone. Uh, this is going to be great. So uh, Amy Lloyd, where does your Mormon story begin? Okay, well... All sides of my family goes back to the very earliest days of the church. Um, I've got apostles in my ancestry. I've got, um, you know, BYU building is named after one of my ancestors. Which one? Um, the Mariner Merrill. The Merrill. Dorm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another, probably my most prominent um, Mormon ancestor is Edwin D. Woolley, who was the grandfather of J. Reuben Clark and Spencer W. Kimball. He was the, one of the first bishops in Salt Lake. He was Brigham Young's business manager. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard that story um, that Brigham Young said, um, you know, if you ever, if he ever falls dead in a lake, you'll find him or in a stream, you'll find him floating, the body floating upstream because he was that cantankerous. Hmm. That was my ancestor that he's talking about. Oh, that wow. Was holy. Um, so yeah. And <laughs> that other story that has kind of become Mormon folklore about Joseph Smith demand, you know, asking at the store owner to give all of his goods and then he's ready to do it. And he says, "Never mind. that was just a test of faith. That same same man that was mm. him. So yeah, I'm steeped in Mormon history, just pioneer stock all the way back, both sides. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. And yeah. so where were you born? And so, also your parents kind of uh, just a tiny bit about them and... Yeah. And, so they were both born and raised in Salt Lake, um, both born and raised in the church. Um, I was told East High School. Yep. East High School. That's right. <laughs> Where a uh, high school musical was filmed. Yep. Yep. That's right. So yeah, they met, they were actually high school sweethearts. Um, and then he went on his mission. He likes to say my mom waited for him. My mom says, maybe, maybe not. Um, <laughs> they did end up getting married, um, of course, and, you know, have had the four of us. I'm number three of four. Um, but yeah, they were, they were both born and raised in the church. Um, my mom's mom actually worked for the first presidency. She was the personal secretary to um, Benson and Tinkley. Whoa. Yeah. What was her name? Eleanor, um, St Eleanor Stevens Odell. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She's wonderful. So um, she's passed away now, but she was wonderful. Um, yeah. And my dad's family was, I would say that his parents weren't real stalwart members of the church, but they did raise their kids in the church kind of more socially, but, and he's always been active, served a mission, the whole, the whole nine. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and, and so they went to the U, right? They both went to the U. Yeah. We're very chagrined that their four children went to BYU <laughs> or BYU as they <laughs> joke with us that they used to call it when they went to school. <laughs> and so total children, you said? Um, they, I'm one of four. Okay. And mm -hmm. where are you in the birth order? I am third. Third. Yep. Okay. Okay. And so, yeah, where, where were you born? I was born in Arizona just for the first few months of my life and then moved to Utah, Sandy, Utah. I lived there for seven years. And then the rest of my childhood I can, um, is, was in California. We moved to Walnut Creek, um, California in the East Bay area. That's where Carolyn Pearson comes that in. That is where she comes <laughs> in. Yeah. So once we moved there, that's where um, she and my mom met and became good friends. And yeah, so that's the connection there. Okay. So... Um, you know, we, we often have people talk about their Mormon upbringing and, um, but w w what do you want to share about your, I mean, we're, we're kind of trying to focus on the theme today yeah. of like listening or not listening to your inner voice. Right. What do you want to share about your, your journey? Yeah. So I would say there were, looking back, there were always certain things that bothered me that those incongruities that I noticed or things that didn't feel quite right. I was always bothered by polygamy, for example. That was always kind of issue number one mm. for me. Um, my mom was always really open about being bothered by that and not liking it, not thinking it was okay. Um, and I would ask about it and kind of get the, you know, I was always very validated in my question for, for one thing, which I really appreciate about my parents. Um, it was, I never felt like I couldn't ask. I never felt like, oh, you must not be very spiritual <laughs> if you're asking. I never got any of that at home because um, my mom was bothered by it too. And I remember asking my dad about it and it was, you know, he agreed, like he didn't love it either. He didn't, but it was more like a don't throw the baby out with the bathwater type um, response. So I noticed some things, but in my own home, um, I think my parents are just so great. Like it never, 
I never felt we did have we definitely had a Mormon home. Like we went to church every Sunday. We we did all of the things. But were, were there good parts about that? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I always felt first of all, the Bay Area is very as far as the church is concerned, it's much more progressive and and liberal. So I don't I don't feel like it was very, you know, dogmatic necessarily. And in my ho- in my own home, I feel like the focus was always on Jesus Christ, or always on loving heavenly parents. Like it was all that was always the focus. Um, so yeah, so we were we were active, definitely always active, um, but they were also a little bit more. Um, I don't want to use the word loose, but I guess for lack of a better word, a little bit more loose about it. Like we wouldn't if we were on vacation, we wouldn't seek out a church to go to on Sunday, or sometimes we would go out to eat on Sundays. Um, specifically because my mom would say that she doesn't want to work on Sunday either. Mm. And the people at the restaurant are already working. So if we go out to eat, one less person is, at least one less person (laughs) is working on (laughs) Sunday, which I thought was a great perspective. (laughs) So valid. So there were things like that where my mom was always really good at offering kind of another way of looking at things, another perspective. Um, So I do remember that about it. Um, I remember one time she called Nephi a twerp. (laughs) which I thought was hilarious. Um, And she just said, you know, that must be annoying for Laman and Lemuel to always be, to always have their little brother pestering them about not being righteous enough. Like that would probably be really irritating. Like I could see why they were sometimes annoyed. Like, so she would just, she was just very good about offering kind of another perspective on things. And for our Never Mormon viewers and listeners, Nephi is a character in the Book of mm-hmm. Mormon, one of the first early heroes of the Book of Mormon, who's a younger brother, but who's strong and righteous and faithful. Right. And you could view him as super righteous or as kind of pretentious yeah. and arrogant and annoying <laughs> yeah. you know, well, to his and, older brothers, right? And very right. favored. Yes, right. very favored. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think I think she brought that up one time too. Like that would probably be hard to always feel like your brother gets all the attention, your brother gets all the kudos. Like that. He's so she, favored of the Lord, right. right? Yeah. So she was very good at not only like the Nephi perspective, but the Laman and Lemuel perspective. Like mm. what, what must it have been like from them? Like they're teenagers or young adults uprooted from their life because of a dream that their father had, like they probably had friends that they were leaving behind. Maybe they had girlfriends that they were leaving behind. Like that's a lot to ask. (laughs) And then to always just be painted as complainers. Like, that's a lot like, of cool, that's cool empathy on your mom's yes, part. Yes, yes. And to, that's, I really feel like there were several times where empathy was brought in, compassion was brought in. Like, mm-hmm. let's look at this maybe from another point of view. And so then I kind of, I think just learned from that example and and kind of was able to start doing that myself when I would hear kind of more problematic scripture stories in the Bible too, mm-hmm. yeah. you know? Once your parents model that ability to question or have mm-hmm. contrary points of view, it frees you up to do the same. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Which so makes I, me wonder how you got off track later from, from your own inner voice. I blame, but we'll I get blame there. BYU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because there's at the same time, like, even though this was going on in my own home, in my own home, I feel like was very supportive of listening to yourself and it, you're still swimming in the waters of, of Mormonism, right? Like you're, mm-hmm. that's still where you're going to church every Sunday. That's still where you're getting lessons. And I can remember a couple of looking back, really problematic young women lessons that even though I loved my leaders, my leaders were always awesome. Um, the lessons themselves, I think were kind of damaging. And, you know, I can remember one where, um, you know, we were talking about what we want to be when we grow up. And I immediately thought I'd like to be a doctor. Like at the time I wanted to be a neonatologist and it was something that I hadn't voiced a whole lot, but I'd kind of started thinking that. And I remember feeling like almost a little bit nervous, like I was going to be brave and actually say I wanted to be a doctor, which first of all, like the fact that I felt like that would be a brave thing Mm -hmm. to voice is a problem, right? Like that shouldn't have been a problem for me to feel like I was brave in voicing that. But ultimately I wasn't because I was one of the last ones to go around the room and every single girl before me said she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. And so that's what I said too. Hmm. And a big part of me did want to be a stay-at-home mom. I had a stay-at-home mom and I loved it. And so I feel like part of it too, there's this, it all ends up being fraught because if I chose not to be a stay-at-home mom, is that me implicitly saying something about my mom? Am I saying that I didn't appreciate that she was a stay-at-home mom? You know, and so all of these things just, you and, you know, arguably maybe I internalized things too much, but I did. And 
so I don't know. So there was that lesson. There was another one can where I, can I just say yeah. there in psychology there are a few like super famous studies. Yes, I was thinking, you, you of, that were thinking too. of the same thing. There, there's one called the Ash Line Conformity Study, where they get like ten people, nine of them are actors, to um, sit in a room and uh, comment on you know the length of a line. And long story short. All of the nine Confederates or actors are paid to give the wrong answer to see whether the tenth person mm -hmm. will give the right answer, which is obvious, yeah. or the wrong answer because the previous nine people gave yeah. the wrong answer. And something like two thirds of the people give the wrong answer just to confirm, wow. even though and they so, know because yeah. it's even, obvious yeah. which is longest. Yeah. And that's it's a classic yeah. study. Look it up: the Ash yeah. Line Conformity Study. But you almost, oh yeah. You almost perfectly yeah. repeated that just in a Mormon mm -hmm. context. Oh, yeah. Conformity is powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, especially when the message is, <clears throat> you you know, I grew up and I was after Benson, or maybe he was the prophet when I was little. I don't remember now. Mid-80s. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so I was, you know, Benson and Hinckley were the, were the prophets of my, you know, childhood. And I mean, he gave that awful talk about mothers oh, come home and um, a mother, their woman's places in the right, home and the, the mother's places in the home. their kids exactly. if they work outside the home. Exactly. And that's yeah. God's mouthpiece, right? So what are you going to do? Like yeah. do you go against something that God's told you to do? Yeah. And there are people who, who were able to do that. My own, my own OB currently, like she is just a couple years older than me. So she was raised in the same time and she's Mormon and she's a doctor. Like, so obviously people do kind of do it anyways, but I feel like, and this is something I've thought a lot about, like why were some people able to not internalize that and still do what they were, but I wasn't. And I guess maybe some of it just comes down to personality. It I'm is. a yeah. people pleaser by nature. 100%. And I feel like I had, I always feel like I've had enough defiance in me to notice things and be bothered by them, but not quite enough to do them anyways, you know? And mm. so I had kind of just the wrong amount of defiance. <laughs> And I don't know. So this other story that comes to mind, the the young women lesson was it was along those lines. But I remember it was, you know, a, a mom was at home and she was upstairs ironing and kind of taking care of the house and her kids were outside playing. And one of them comes in and calls out for her mom, mom. And she says, oh, I'm up here, honey. And what do you need? And oh, nothing. And runs back outside to play. She's like, that was kind of weird. So a few minutes later, another child comes in, same thing happens. He calls out for her. She, you know, tells him where she is and he's like, oh, okay. And runs back outside to play. This happens with the third child. So finally she goes outside and she says, you guys, like, are you okay? Everyone keeps coming in and calling for me, but then just like running back outside, like, do you guys need anything? And they say, oh no, we just wanted to know that you were home. Mm -hmm. Like, how was, how was I supposed to go to med school after that? Like, how was I supposed to want to be anything else? Because I always did want to be a mom. And being a mom is the greatest joy of my life. I adore my kids. And I've always wanted to be a really good mom. And when that lesson is taught to you that the only way to really be a good mom is to be only a mom, that's what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And and dads don't have to choose. They can no. be dads and have careers. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Why should moms have to choose? Yeah. I think it's really important to recognize too, you were talking about personality types and how for you, um, you know, you, you, that dream sort of died right inside you of being a doctor. Where, yeah. Whereas a different personality, um, you know, went ahead and became a doctor as mm -hmm. a woman. But I also think it's really important to say that all those internalized things are likely there in yeah. the woman that's tr is working. That's what I've found right. for the women I know that did it anyway. There's like incredible amounts of guilt oh, they yes. walk with every day. Oh yeah. So and we, yeah, outwardly they oh, yeah. they made that choice, but inwardly, yeah. like it's still, you know, yeah. absolutely insidious messaging. Well, and I'll I'll definitely talk about that later in my story when we get there too, because at, at this point I have done both. I I was a stay at home mom for for several years, and then I've been a working mom as well, and so I definitely had all of that as well. And it's not even that it, it is for a lot of people that the dream dies, but I almost didn't even allow myself to get that far oh, down the dream it. path with it. it. Yeah. Right. You know, the thought was in my head, oh, maybe I want to be a doctor. And then I just kind of immediately squashed it mm. and didn't, you know, and who knows, like maybe I ultimately wouldn't have chosen to do that. I don't know. There's no way to really know now, but just the fact that 
having you know, the choice. Right. I didn't, and I didn't feel like I really had the choice. Yeah. Okay. So those are some damaging young women's stories. Yeah. That I didn't even really recognize as super damaging at the time, but now like looking back for mm-hmm. sure. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so. I think it's gotten much better. I don't, I don't notice as much of that anymore, but that's almost a thing that's frustrating too, because there's never, like we might kind of universally view it even within Mormonism, that Benson talk as being damaging and not appropriate. And like people don't necessarily quote from it anymore, but it is there and it's never been kind of taken off and it's never been, oh, hey, yeah, denounced, definitely never denounced or apologized for or anything like that. And People might not agree with it now, but at the time, if you tried to disagree with it, that's right. That's a no go, right? right? And it kind of affected that generation so in a certain badly, way. yes. When Margie and I were raising our daughters and, you know, our kids in Logan just, you know, 10 years ago, we noticed just how comprehensively mother and non working outside the home focused mm-hmm. their Mormon upbringings were in the 2010s. Oh, yeah. And, You know, it just goes to show you that the church can stop emphasizing something from the pulpit, but the cultural Mm. teachings can persist for decades, if not longer, even when the teachings are no longer emphasized. Absolutely. And I think part of that is because of this thing of prophets. And that kind of brings me to another incongruity that I would notice. You can disagree with the prophet, but never in real time. Never nev- vocally. Ne- well, never in, <laughs> never at the time, yeah, right? right? It always has to be yeah. after there's at least one or two other prophets. <laughs> then you can maybe go a couple prophets back and disagree with what the previous not, one not, said, well, maybe, but never but, at the time. But at church, if you're like, Joseph Smith was messed up here or there, or Brigham Young oh, was yeah. bad here or there. Oh, there's still a point, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm just talking about like with this Benson talk, for example. Okay. It's people I think are, <laughs> I think actually currently right now, like one of Julie Hanks's recent mm-hmm. posts is about that, is about that talk. But she's constantly talking to her stake president about whether she gets to stay a member. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's not like it's easy for Julie yeah. Hanks to yeah, do that. That's, that's true. That's, I'm that's sure it's I'm not. Yeah. But there's, I think, probably zero <laughs> chance if it, if it was a yeah. talk that was current. For sure. Right? Yeah, for sure. That, there's no way that's going to fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So true. So you can yeah. disagree, but never in real time. Yeah, yeah. And so that's always that's kind of a struggle of mine with this concept of profits in general, too. And especially with with how emphatically it's taught that they speak for God rather than just being in, inspired leaders or something like that. It's when when you are taught that they speak for God and you take that seriously and you internalize that, what else are you going to do other than take their words to heart? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And then it gets very confusing when a past prophet has said something that is universally understood to be problematic, like some of the racist things that we've heard, in, you know, that now nobody agrees with. But like in the past, it's what do you do with that if they were speaking for God? So then the choice either becomes to me, I don't know of any other way to pair it other than they either don't speak directly for God or God's very fickle and sometimes not too nice. Right. Like it, it just, I don't know how to pair it. And some people are able to and good for them, I guess, but I don't know how to do it. So as a teen, how did you process all that? Well, so as a teen, I think it more just came in as confusion, like things that I would, I would hear that I'd be like, oh, I don't, that doesn't really feel right. Like, I don't really like that. But then it was always just kind of ultimately, well, you pack that down. Yeah. You pack it down and yeah. well, don't worry about it. We can't yeah. know all things. We can't, you know. I would kind of There's get that, that answer. Isaiah 55 like, scripture that you learn in scripture mastery. The Lord's ways are higher than man's ways. Right. And we don't understand yeah. the Lord's wisdom. Which kind of leads me to another <laughs> dichotomy though, because why would God make our, like God made us, right? Under this, you know, these beliefs. Why would he make our brains incapable of understanding his ways, but then hold us to the understanding of his ways. Why would like, the, why would God create the natural man, which yeah, is an enemy to and God? And make it an enemy. Yeah, right? like that doesn't make any sense <laughs> yeah, to me, right? I've never like, thought about that before. Right. So <laughs> it's just all of these things, like even the, even the answers that you get end up being mm-hmm. just brand new dichotomies that you have to kind of figure out. And it was just very confusing. But yeah, ultimately, I think... It, it never occurred to me to to not believe. So you just kind of have to figure out a way to live with it. And I think, you know, you just kind of live with that cognitive dissonance for a while. Yeah, so were sense. you, were you, uh, if we were kind of drop in on your teen kind of years and see you and how you functioned and coped during those years, it, what did that look like? Like, were you aware that you kind of had this inner world where things weren't 
all sitting right? Yeah. Or were, was it more like, and did you have kind of that outward self? So you were kind of doing all the things, but then having this separate experience internally? Or like, how did you yeah. experience that? Well, I think for me, I was I was fortunate in the area that I was being raised in because with the exception of the cut, the stories I just shared, like in general, my church experiences were very positive. And I, I do feel like I, I was in a more kind of liberal ward. And so it wasn't, I don't feel like I butted up against it a whole lot. I just, so when I noticed it, I, it was more just, well, I don't know that I love that or mm-hmm. I don't know if I agree with that. Mm-hmm. If I would ask my fam- my parents about it, I, I was definitely validated. So I didn't feel like I couldn't express that. Nice. But yeah. then it was just kind of, that's not, that's not the focus anyways. Like, let's not worry about it type of thing. And it was easy to do that because it wasn't really the focus as much mm-hmm. where I was. So I don't know. That's, I guess, hard to answer in a way. I mm-hmm. I think that I I would definitely outwardly kind of did all the things, right? I was very, I was a very, you know, good girl. Um but I also like didn't really want to not be like that anyway, like, kind of fit personality wise in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. At that time, would you say you were very invested in kind of the Mormon plan, the Mormon sort of structure of how your life would yes. go? Were you, you were bought into that. Oh, yeah. You were bought in. Yeah. In terms of like wanting, you know, going to college, getting married, having kids, being stay at home, all, all of that. Yeah. 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 I did. I never had an interest in going on a mission, though. I will say that. That was never interested, interesting to me. Mm. Um, for one thing, it wasn't, you know, I'm 44 now. So at the time it wasn't as prevalent for girls to be going. Like you, yeah, they definitely did. It wasn't like it was rare for them to. And I had several friends who did, um, but it was totally fine if you didn't want to. Like, yeah. So, and it was just not something that ever interested in me. I, I always kind of felt like live and let live. Like, why do I care if someone else is more or not? Like, I didn't care. Like, I didn't, I didn't have this evangelical, you know, spirit about me at all. Oh, got it. And if we were going to look at kind of your associations and connections during that time, living in Walnut Creek, California, Mm -hmm. were the majority of your friends Mormon? No, no, not at all. Um, I had really just one good friend who was Mormon. Um, And she is an example, actually, she and her family are an example of, of women who were able to kind of overcome or not let themselves be stifled by that same, by that exact same programming. And I actually, I actually saw her the other day and kind of had a conversation with her about this, but she was one of five girls and they also had a son. And so five strong women in that family. And it was always very much, um, you know, girl power. We can do anything. There was almost I think they did have the right amount of defiance to be able mm-hmm. to kind of overcome that, right? I had like half defiance, so I didn't quite overcome it, but they did. So I know that there are examples of it. Yeah. So so going back to your story, where mm-hmm. did we pick up? Oh, gosh. Okay. So high school, um, I guess another thing that was really formative for me, um, I just, I had a, I had someone I was close to who really struggled a lot with um, scrupulosity um, or religious OCD. And that was very, um, hard to watch. Um, and I, I don't know that. So that's like hyper righteousness. Yeah. yeah. Fear Mm -hmm. drives to be pure and perfect. Mm -hmm. That, that really is a, is more of a mental illness than it is righteous, you know, healthy righteousness. Yeah. And, and I think kind of watching that a couple of things happened. I think I, and I don't know if I even processed it this way at the time, but I think I started noticing that maybe some of the messaging we get at church isn't always super helpful, isn't always really very healthy. Like be there for perfect. Right. For, like, again, it's personality. For some people, that's like, mm-hmm. oh, I'll try and do better. Right. For other people, that means they have to be perfect. Right. And it can become devastating to their right. mental health. Yeah. Well, and there's this idea of, of you know, talks from the pulpit being, being meant for kind of the the people that need to hear it, like the lowest common denominator, right? But those people aren't listening. And the ones that are, are really internalizing it. And it can do a lot of harm. And I think that was kind of my first experience of of recognizing that maybe there are not healthy messages going on. But I must, I didn't take it too far down that road because I think it just went somewhere in me, Mm -hmm. noticing it. Um, Yeah. 
because so you I saw was, this friend, we'll say friend, we yeah. saw this friend starting to struggle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just really, um, yeah. And I, and from what I observed, like the, the help that was, that was being asked for at church, like the, the response from the church was not very compassionate. Um, it was more, well, you know, sometimes this is a holy war that we're fighting and sometimes there are casualties on all sides. Like that, it was very much not, mm-hmm. in my view, how Jesus would respond. And it it really was uncomfortable. It was hard for me to, to watch that. And it was hard for me to kind of see that, again, that dichotomy of aren't we supposed to, don't you go after the one? Like, isn't isn't it supposed to be this compassion, empathy filled thing? Like, why are we hearing messages that can make somebody, that can damage somebody, that can really be harmful? How is it affecting your friend, just in a couple general ways? Um, you know, I don't want to speak, I don't want to speak for anybody else. So I, I'll kind of leave it to just what my observation was, which was just that I, to me, I saw that sometimes church messaging is, mm-hmm. is not healthy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. And watching someone really yeah. suffer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So that was another kind of um, formative thing for me growing up. Um, but overall, I really will say that overall, I felt like I loved my childhood. I feel like overall it was very positive. Um, certainly in my own home where the church was concerned, it was very much love focused and Christ focused and mm-hmm. um, compassion focused and empathy focused and um, so I've always really appreciated that about my parents and I how I was raised. Say, yeah, I relate. And I think Margie will too, that we, we lost our faith in 2001, but decided to raise our children in the mm-hmm. church thinking that if we just had positive balanced messages at home, we would neutralize and overcome any of the messages that our kids received at church. And mm-hmm. we were super wrong. Yeah. It definitely, we definitely <laughs> underestimated, I think, yeah. the impact that church messaging would have. And we definitely overestimated, I think, our inoculation ability. Yeah. Because yeah, kids famously care much more about social messaging than what their parents have to say, right. especially in the teen years. Right. And if the messaging is all around purity, purity, right. modesty, perfectionism, yeah. uh, anti-LGBT, whatever it is, yeah. your kids are going to absorb those messages right? W- whether you try to neutralize them or not. Yeah. And I do think that some neutral neutralizing happens. Um, like I can remember in, in general, I was a very, I was, like I said, I was a very good girl. I didn't, you know, I towed the line and didn't even view it as towing the line. I just, I was very I was and by good, good girl, and yeah, yeah, I gotta say that. Saying that in the it, let's talk about good because I do yeah. think. What do you mean when you say good? Sometimes good um, can mean depriving yourself of healthy normative experiences. It's like yeah. obedience. Well, and that it's probably more of an did happen. Pleaser, there wasn't a whole lot of obedient. dating going on, for example. But okay. um, but yeah, you know, I got good grades. I went to. I was, you know, my maid and beehive president. Like I did my personal progress. I, you know, all of that stuff. Um, I did have a rebellious moment, um, where I got caught drinking. I do have that experience. And I bring that up just to, just to give an example of neutralizing that happened. Cause I think that when I, that could have, depending on my parents' response could have been a very shame filled experience. And it wasn't at all. Um, my parents' response to that was very loving and very about my safety and about my health and not, I don't remember church being brought up at all. Um, other than my dad saying, um, I remember him saying to me, um, listen, everyone's going to have their own temptations and things that, you know, you know, rules and temptations that other people might not have. This is not one of mine, but if it's going to be one of yours, you need to be smarter about it. (laughs) And that's the extent of how much church was brought in to, to that. I wasn't told I need to go to the bishop. I wasn't told that I made Jesus sad. I wasn't told any of that stuff. And there was no shaming involved at all. It was very much like, this is, this was not healthy for you. Like, this is not a healthy choice. Like, you know, it was very much about my safety and not about sin or morality. And Mm -hmm. so I do think that that, that they did a good job of neutralizing what otherwise could have been a harmful message, you know, in Mm -hmm. the, in the discipline of that. Yeah. 
Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. So should we leave the high school years or yeah, I do you think want to so. talk about your testimony at all? Is that important? Oh, or was yeah. it just a it traditional was, testimony or? I would say, I would say it was very strong, very strong. Um, I, you know, I've, I play music and it's always, music's always been an important part of my life and of my upbringing. And I was always doing, you know, helping with musical numbers at church and singing. And I always felt the spirit so strongly when I was singing and involved in those things. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I had a very strong testimony. I I felt things very, very deeply. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what came after high school? So not a I, mission. <laughs> no, not a mission. I did go to, I went to BYU. Um, and that was another instance, I think, where I ignored my own kind of what I wanted to do. Um, I had gotten into UCSD, um, San Diego, and chose to go to BYU instead. And I think a big driving factor in that was that I was, um, I was tired of feeling different. I didn't want to kind of have to explain my beliefs anymore. I, it was really attractive to me to be in a place where everybody else was Mormon too. And I maybe didn't have to feel, you know, uncomfortable about being Mormon or, um, Mm -hmm. I, it was very attractive to me to go to, to go to BYU for that reason. And looking back, like that's kind of a bummer because I think UCSD would have been a great school. (laughs) So, um, and who knows, like maybe, I wouldn't have decided to go there anyways, but again, it's all of these decisions that are so informed by the church and what you're told is right. And that's kind of just what you end up doing, whether it's kind of what you want to do or not. Can I ask in your, uh, like your Walnut Creek ward, um, was UCSD and BYU, were they seen as like equal decisions or was BYU kind of a a step up from a more righteous decision um, then. I'm just curious about your messaging, the messaging you received around yeah, that. I, I don't even know if, I feel like so much of this stuff was internalized because I think that if I had decided to go to UCSD, it would have been great. Like, I don't feel like, and I think that there were a couple of girls in my ward who didn't go to BYU and I don't feel like they got judged for it at all. Um, I don't know. I also had two sib- two older siblings who were who had gone there, and so that was probably part of mm-hmm. what enticed me about it. Um, yeah, but I do think there was definitely this idea of, well, like that's where you'll be more likely to meet a Mormon husband, and where you know it was definitely more the natural thing to do, and it was it was definitely seen as, um, you know, a big deal that you got into BYU, and that's great, and. I was worried I might not because I actually didn't go to seminary um, and got in anyways. And so it was, I do feel like it was a little bit of a source of pride, but I don't remember, I don't remember my ward being like super gung-ho either way. I just, for whatever reason, internally felt like I should probably go there instead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One thing I'm just curious about living near the University of Utah and now having some kids who have gone there and knowing that several Mormon apostles were super proud youths. I'm curious why back then with your parents being graduates of the U or at least having attended the U, why applying to the University of Utah where there would be a strong institute program yeah. and a lot of Mormons. Uh, I, I, I totally get that, that, that that's how it was. It yeah. was for me too. BYU is the only consideration. I'm yeah. just wondering in your case why, especially in your family. Right, since my parents went to the U. Why yeah, the U wasn't more of like a possibility. I think for, I think that the <clears throat> thing I did not like about the U and that I, I think is still true is that it's more of a commuter school. So mm-hmm. I think it's, le- I mean, I don't know if I say it's still true. I don't actually know. But it seems like it's more of a commuter school than it is like. Meaning kid, not enough kids lived on campus right. and not enough right. campus life. That's what it seemed like to okay. me. Okay. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's yeah. what it seemed like. And I really liked the idea of going to BYU campus and living on, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it was fun. I, I actually really did like BYU. <laughs> I mean, the first BYU is a marriage funnel for the Mormon church. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because kids that don't get married to Mormons often leave the church at a higher rate than kids who marry Mormons. Yeah. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. So BYU has been the marriage funnel for 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. 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 My yeah. mom said at the U, they used to call it Breedham Young University. Breedham Young. Breedham. Breedham, Breedham, Breedham Young. Young. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's oh, dear. awesome. Okay. Yeah. 
And I don't feel like at least I, at least, um, but this is topical to your story particularly, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Keep, sorry. Keep going. No, at least explicitly, I don't feel like I was going there to meet a, to meet a husband. I don't feel like that was my, my conscious motivation Uh at all. Conscious. But I'm sure unconsciously (laughs) it was uh, at least part of it. For me, it was super conscious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think for a lot of people it is. Yeah, I think gr- that, yeah. again, going back to that like half amount of defiance that I had, like <laughs> I would never have like admitted that, right? But it probably did play but in. But see, that's the parental conditioning and the inner voice versus the social conditioning. Yeah. Exactly. You may, you may have some conscious preferences, mm-hmm. but often what wins out. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah, absolutely. The social conditioning. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the conformity. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but I did, I did love BYU, especially my first two years. Loved it. Loved it. I had a lot of fun and, and it was nice to be around people who, you know, felt the same as you and who believed the same as you, at least, at least on the outside. And I kind of ended up feeling different there too, because I think I was, you know, maybe didn't internally conform as much as as other people did. And so things started to bother me. And I think my cognitive dissonance really ramped up when I was there. Um, was that like 97? When were you? you were yeah. You? So I would have started in the fall of 97. Okay. Yeah. Graduated in 2001. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was fun though. We, BYU is a funny place. Like we had, I, I made some great friends there and friends that I'm, people I'm still really good friends with today. Um, really, I met some really good people there, but yeah, it's a funny place. I remember my, I remember my, was this my fresh, no, it must've been a little bit later on, but, um, the daily universe had a, you know, an opinion you could write like any newspaper, you could write in opinions. And there was a guy who wrote in about how inappropriate it was for girls to wear crossbody bags because it accentuated you know, their boobs and that, like how inappropriate that is. And girls should not wear those because it's, you know, makes it harder for the guys, I guess. And it was this back and forth, ridiculous wow. thing in the newspaper for weeks. And one that I, so I was glued to it because it was highly entertaining, but just so ridiculous. And, you know, obviously tons of people writing in about how ridiculous it is, but then tons of people defending him and agreeing with him. And this one girl writes in that maybe we should all, maybe we should all just stop wearing seatbelts too, if that would help, if that would help the men (laughs) and just highlighting how ridiculous that was. So it's just a funny place. It was just, it was a funny place. (laughs) But but like BYU-Idaho has had that either formal or informal policy for decades where, where they literally can't wear crossbody bags? Where where women have been discouraged from either either officially or unofficially from wearing book, you know book bags or purses. That is crazy. That, that, that I've heard many BYU Idaho students say that was culturally forbidden. So wow. so like BYU Idaho usually is like takes takes BYU to eleven. Yeah. So to speak. Yeah. For I sure. I call it Mormon Saudi Arabia, but it's just. <laughs> Historically, it's been literally that that sort wow. of the thing. Yeah. Wow. Well, luckily at BYU Provo, it was more just a funny. Most people, I think, rolled their eyes and thought it was ridiculous. So, but yeah, I mean, even the fact that somebody feels comfortable writing that in is mm-hmm. a little silly, right? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And the yeah. lens on women's bodies. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Just. Okay. And so what. Do you want to talk about your voice and dissonance between your inner voice and messages or experiences you were having at BYU? Anything you want to say about that other than what you said? Well, for one thing, with the major I chose, um, you know, I'd already kind of not allowed myself to go the, the med school route. And I thought to myself, that is what I was interested in is medicine. And I wanted to help babies and I wanted to, um, you know, do that stuff, but I refused to pivot. Once I decided not to be a doctor, because at the time it was, well, then I'm not going to graduate till I'm 32 and I don't want to wait that long to have kids. And then what am I going to do? Like in my mind, the only option other than, um, other than being a stay-at-home mom myself was maybe having, working and having the dad stay home. But that didn't seem like a real viable option to me because it didn't seem like very many Mormon men would sign up for that. And that's not even really what I wanted either. There, it wasn't this, there wasn't this kind of middle normal ground of 
yeah, so you guys will work together and you'll figure it out, right? And there's lots of ways to do that. And actually being a doctor would probably be a great profession as a mom because I don't know, like maybe you could work two days a week or something. And I don't know, maybe doctors out there listening will be like, ha ha, that's not true. But I don't know. I just, I didn't allow myself to even go there as a possibility, but I also didn't want to pivot to nursing, which you'd think I would just do nursing then because that was too stereotypical. And I had enough Mm -hmm. defiance in me that I wasn't going to go to BYU and be a elementary ed or a nursing major. And (laughs) which is unfortunate because I actually probably would have loved nursing. And So that's kind of a bummer too, because both in trying to conform and in trying to not be so conforming, (laughs) I ended up ignoring my own inner Uh, voice, right? Like both, I got it on both sides. Mm, Yeah. And so instead, um, I was like, okay, well, what about accounting? And I thought of someone in my family, maybe my sister or my mom suggested accounting because BYU is really a really one of the nationally best accounting programs. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like always two or three in the, in the country. And that appealed to me because that's, if it's hard to get into, then that's kind of a a point of, you know, proving something and I can do this too. And Mm -hmm. so that's what I ended up doing. And I took the first accounting class and actually loved it. So I was like, okay, that's what I can do. But I don't know that, I don't think I would have made that same choice again. Like it, it isn't, it's worked out okay. And I, I landed fine and it it ended up working out well later on when I needed to go back to work. But, um, but yeah, I don't think it's certainly not where my passion is and not probably what I would have chosen. So it was a choice made very much because I was both wanting to conform and not wanting to conform. Mm -hmm. So, um, something funny about that when I made it into the program, which is hard to get into. Um, so I was excited that I, that I tested into it. And um, another girlfriend of mine who was also in the program, we were, we went up to the office to turn in some paperwork for it or something. I don't remember exactly why we were in the accounting office and a student, a male student came in and told us that we were taking, like, how dare we be in the program because we were taking the spot of a breadwinner. Hmm. That happened. Mm-hmm. That happened. Mm. So we and were just like- how that make you feel? Uh, well- which side came out, the submissive or the dominant or the, the rebellious? The rebellious side okay, came out okay. at, for sure. And my my friend and I looked at each other and, and then he just quickly left. He didn't like wait for a response. And we were too stunned to give one immediately. <laughs> and and then we just looked at each other and laughed it off. But I mean, that was yeah. pretty stunning that he would say that. And those messages can still settle subconsciously. Absolutely. Even if consciously yes. you kind of shake them off. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. It kind of tells you your place. Yeah. And I had a friend who did go to med school and she was told the same thing. Yeah. That by her being pre-med, she was taking the spot of a breadwinner. Yeah. Yeah. So, so not appropriate. And again, not something that I think would probably happen now, but it happened then. Yeah. I think it would still happen now. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 Culture doesn't change. It takes a long time. In 10 or 20, 30 years, it takes longer. Yeah. Okay. Well... Yeah. So, um, how did that, how did your BY experience kind of yeah. wrap up for you? Yeah. So I, um, you know, did the accounting program and, and got through that and ended up junior year th- because of the accounting program meeting, uh, my first husband. And that was interesting too. I don't, um, I don't ultimately think we were very compatible. Um, I will say you did avoid the trap of like the freshman marriage to the RM. Yeah. Which shows you had something going on inside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I did have friends who got married after freshman year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he, you know, I don't ultimately think we were a very good match. I, I remember relying very heavily on the talk that was, that we, it was delivered or quoted from at one of the BYU devotionals about any two, any two good people can have a mm-hmm. successful marriage. Any two um, righteous Yeah, any Mormons two righteous Mormons, something along those can lines. Can have a successful can marriage. Can have a successful marriage. So don't worry about compatibility. Right. Yeah. Don't worry about taking your time yes. to get to know each other. Right. If you're both righteous, right. just, It'll work just itself punch, out. punch in. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. I, remember, I remember reading and rereading that talk. And I actually even went to uh, 
BYU counselor because I actually did have concerns about the relationship. It was pretty, it was pretty rocky. Even when we were dating, we broke up several times and, um, I went to a counselor over it. And instead of being like, you're 21 years old, (laughs) like, Maybe he's just not the right person for you. And that's why you feel like this. <laughs> yeah. Instead, his response is very flippant. And it was, well, I mean, if you get married, though, like what's the worst that happens is you get divorced and that you can work that out. And I thought there's another incongruity. Like what is happening? Like we marriage is supposed to be it's taught in this church as being the the best thing you can do, right? Like that's one of the greatest things. It's very sacred. It's very it's forever. It's not it's very serious. And yet this BYU counselor is is being so flippant almost in a way to to get me to just get married which which felt very confusing but again i was like well i guess i guess that's true i guess there would be worse things and you know i again was relying very heavily on this talk and and i don't know why i don't i don't know it's a million other people would have recognized that maybe it just wasn't the right relationship um but for whatever reason i felt I just felt compelled to work it out and to keep going with it. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I do want to make a make a quick pause to just say that I there is nothing in my life that I would do any differently if it means like not having the life I have now. <laughs> so I would not trade my kids for anything. I would not. So from that perspective, like I would do everything exactly the same because mm-hmm. I would never risk not having them. So I don't want it to come across like, I'm regretting this so much, but like just to make the point that I, I don't think I made decisions that were in line with myself. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. That's always so tricky, right? Because yeah. I don't, I don't want my kids to be thinking that you know I wish that didn't happen because that is 100% not true. Like I would do zero things different if it meant not having them. Like mm-hmm. I would never risk that. Um, so just wanted to make that clear. I hear that, um, and yeah. I also think that piece of advice from the therapist, Mm -hmm. it really ignores, I think, the conditioning of women around staying at home because it, for women that get married and then, you know, oftentimes you have children really quickly and then get divorced, it's very different for Mm -hmm. a woman than for the man, the breadwinning man and the woman that has only gone to school be- knowing that she's going to stay at home, right. that power differential, that opportunity differential, it leaves the woman so vulnerable. Yes. That just completely ignored all of yes. that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I did have an accounting degree to fall back on, which I'm grateful for. And that ended up being a very good thing, but it doesn't mean I didn't start at the bottom. And I I always did. I, I did work for a few years after we got married, um, but it always was... it if I approached it more like a temp job because mm-hmm. it, it was always just until I had, until I had my first baby. Yeah. And so I didn't put the, and made part of it too, because I wasn't passionate about accounting. That's probably not the right field I should have gone into for yes, what I was interested like in. a web. Right. Mm-hmm. But also it's, it, it did always feel very temporary. It was all, I always viewed it as temporary. And so there wasn't the same attention given to building a career and to, and, you know, to getting, mm. I'm sure there are play And actually now my, my job that I have now, I, I really do like a lot. And so maybe I could have gone that route instead, you know, so it's just, it's fraught in so many different ways. Um, but yeah, so we, we got but, married. But after there's gotta we, be, there's gotta be, I meet so many 20 something, 30 something, 40 something Mormon women who, for whom it's both. It's, I love my kids. And yes. I, I totally didn't have informed consent yes. and was operating under, under conformity and social pressure mm-hmm. and not under what I felt would have been best for me or what I truly wanted right. or didn't even know, mm-hmm. didn't even have the chance to get to know what I wanted. Right. And it's got to be both. Yeah. It's, it, it is both. I think it is both. Yeah. And, and I always knew I wanted to be a mom. I had, I had yeah. always wanted to be a mom. And I do think that that is genuine. That was, that was not church conditioning for me. That did line up very strongly for me. Yeah. Um, and but, I don't regret the years that I spent staying home with them either. But, but, but <laughs> I do think that it, timing it's matters. Both. Yeah. Timing, timing matters. matters yeah. And I think that it could have been done in a way that was, 
a little bit more beneficial. And if we're talking about informed consent, I also think culturally, I wonder sometimes what it would, it would be like to have a sense of informed consent around what it means for women's bodies to have mm-hmm. babies. Yeah. Like, I don't think that's discussed enough. Like, hey, right. just so you know. Or mental here, health too. Or mental health. Yeah. yeah. And um, as well for for a partnership to say, hey, it's beautiful you want to have children, and here are some things that you should know research-wise about happiness in partnership once babies Mm -hmm. are introduced, and further down the line, teens, the teen years. I just think that's a very different conversation, Like, and how you would navigate that as a couple would be so different, Yeah, I think, you, you could strategize. You could actually go in saying, okay, so we know this. Right. What do we want to do? How do we want to actually go about that? Sorry, just a yeah. little side, uh, because you mentioned informed right. consent being so important. Right. Oh, and that actually reminds me of a class that I had at BYU on childhood um, child development, um, where they actually taught a study about how children of stay-at-home moms versus children of working moms are are no different in terms of success and happiness and security and all of those things. There's essentially no detrimental effects um, that are measured that are measured for work for children of working moms versus children of stay at home moms. And I remember thinking in that class, well then why are we all taught to be stay to only be stay at home moms? Why is that what's being taught? If you ask BYU are teaching me, and he even went so far, this professor, to say that to say I have found that true in my personal life too. My wife was a stay at home mom for the first you know few of our kids, and then worked with the last two, and they are they're all great. They they all turned out great, right? Like there's so it that was confusing messaging to me. So why why is the church teaching us one thing when we know that that's not the case, and why do I still feel the pressure? to only do that, even though I'm hearing that it was, it was very confusing, the messaging yeah, around that. I can see that. Mm-hmm. So that was something. Um, so I don't know, it was that an attempt at informed consent, like to let women know, like you can't, but, but again, it wasn't, that was kind of all that was said. And then we moved on and I was, you know, I wanted to go talk to him afterwards and ask him more about it. And I just, I just didn't. And, you know, I remember that class though. I remember being like, that's confusing. Mm-hmm. Why is the church teaching us this then? Why is God telling us this? Because that's yeah. how I viewed it, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I had a couple of classes at BYU that kind of gave me pause about things. Like another one, um, I've always been very interested in just religion in general. I think it's fascinating. And um, so I took a Greek mythology class. I thought it was one of my um, just gen eds and thought it was super interesting. And I remember having this thought when I was taking this class that, I wonder, like it is everybody in the world, like nobody in the world thinks of Greek mythology as like religion anymore, right? It's all, it's myth, but it was religion to them. And the thought crossed my mind, like I wonder in 200, 300, 500,000 years, however long, if the religions of our day are gonna be universally seen as myth. And then I was kind of like, huh, I don't know what to do with that. I'm going to put that away. Yeah. But it was interesting. And then another thought I had in that class was on their view of gods, which in a way kind of made more sense than our view of gods, or at least the Christian view of gods. Like we try to make God this all knowing, all powerful, all loving. And yet he commits genocide in the Old Testament. And yet he's, you know, there's all of these things that are not loving, but it's called love anyway. And that's confusing, at least with Greek mythology, they might be like, yeah, Zeus is a real jerk sometimes, but like, he's, right. a, god, he's a god, what can you do? Yeah. Like, <laughs> right? Like he's yeah. bad, you gotta do what he says. Yeah. But at least they acknowledge and they don't try to call, mm-hmm. they don't try to call it love, yeah. right? They just acknowledge, yeah, he's kind of a jerk sometimes. Or yeah, Poseidon's got a real angry streak, right? Like they don't try to, <laughs> yeah. they don't try to act like it, these stories where they're clearly not being loving, but they're all loving, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so confusing. just kind of some questions, yeah. Some just confusing dichotomies on even just the nature of God and what does that mean? And I was raised with such a strong faith that 
in a loving God that it's made some of these other messages feel extra confusing, I think, because that that's something that I just have, have held on to. What I think is super complex is that if you think about the classic abusive profile, it's always someone who's super loving and warm yes. and then violent and abusive. That's right. Yeah. And then after they're called out on their abusiveness, mm -hmm. they can switch back to the super loving. It's classic abuse cycle and the triangulation of victim and <laughs> aggressor and, mm -hmm. you know, all of that stuff. And How yeah. can that not permeate into right. Mormon culture? Well, and even into what you end up tolerating in relationships and you're, you're not going to recognize unhealthy behaviors if that's kind of been internalized. If it's divinely mandated right. and you, inspired. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, exactly. And if all you're given is emotional immaturity models, mm -hmm. yeah. then it's just, it's really a recipe. Right. You know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And there was a lot of that, like a lot of this kind of messaging that just, like, I remember going to devotionals and hearing things that didn't quite sit right, but I wasn't sure exactly why. Like I would hate those ones where they talked about their wives and how much their wives did, but because it was always in the context Meaning of- Meaning the general authorities, right? Yes. Okay. Because it was always in the context of, you know, because I was so busy and I was off doing this and this and this and my wife took care of everything home, but she never complained, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like the, how many times have you heard that? That's the idea. About, an, about a she Mormon woman. She always wore lipstick when I got home. And, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't remember that exact one, but yeah, probably. But yeah, I remember the ones. It was like she never complained. I remember hearing that one a lot. And maybe because of my mom's lame and Lemuel story, I, maybe that's why that one rubbed me wrong. Yeah, so I was like, murmur. maybe she had a reason to complain right, sometimes. Yeah, like, and right. what's wrong with that? Like, yeah. what's wrong with voicing that maybe something's not right? Like, but it was, it was very much this implicit, like teaching that you just take it, you just take it and you don't complain about it. Mm -hmm. And service, you don't, yeah, always you don't serving, have needs, don't long suffering. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there was that. And then there was this, I mean, the worst manifestation of that was Warren Jeffs. He used to have keep sweet yes. written on, on his feet. Yeah. And yeah. when the women would come in to complain, mm -hmm. he'd put his feet up on the desk right. and they would read keep sweet, right. which basically meant yeah. stay, yeah. shut up and do your, do your job. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I do, yeah. I think that she never complained and she just, she, she asked, we asked her how she did it. And she just said, well, I never expected much out of him. Ha ha ha. Like, <laughs> and everyone just kind of laughs about that. And I was like, that's, that's not actually funny. Like that's like, you should have helped her more. <laughs> like, And it has an impact of perpetuating an impact. The, those, those, those systems. Yes. Right. Yes. The church, the God church patriarchy system just gets replicated in the, yeah. in the marriage and in right. the family unit. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's all of that stuff going on. Another time at BYU, I remember um, having a, a Relief Society lesson. I think it was it was in those years where we were doing teachings of the prophets. And so like each year was a different prophet focused on the manual. This one, I th I'm i pretty sure was Wilford Woodruff. Um, it was definitely one of the first four because he I knew that he had more than one wife. And of course, polygamy has always kind of been a real issue for me. Um and I remember in this lesson, they read a love letter that he wrote to his wife, the only wife that they mentioned that he had in the lesson, completely omitted the fact that he had many others. And they read this love letter, and it was this beautiful, sweet, loving letter, and that made all the girls Aw, in the in the class. And <laughs> afterwards, I remember I was talking to my roommate, and she said, "Wasn't that letter so sweet?" And I couldn't even help myself. I said, "I said it was, but I wonder if he wrote a similar letter for all of his other wives too." And she was really kind of taken aback by that. But I was like, "Well, what? Which one's worse? Like, is it worse if he did, or is it worse if he didn't? Because if he did." then that kind of cheapens it all, right? But if he didn't, then I feel really bad for all of those other wives who don't have a husband who loves them like that. So I noticed these things. I did notice it. And I did, mm -hmm. I would have my kind of moments of defiance or moments of rebellion where I would voice things or where I wasn't okay with things, but it just wasn't enough for me to really listen to myself for real, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So, That's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think being at BYU too kind of made me a little more orthodox in a lot of ways too, because I felt like, of course, it's kind of this classic, you hear this all the time on your podcast, but like, I felt like I was the problem. Something's wrong with me mm -hmm. that I'm not 
you know, that I'm not ooing and aahing over this, that I, that I'm not chuckling at the cute, quippy devotional talk about, you know, what's wrong with me. And so I think it made me very susceptible to feeling like I was the problem and I need to be the one that changed. And so then when I was with somebody that was more, um, more letter of the law than I was really comfortable with, rather than just recognizing that we're not a good match, it was, well, something must be wrong with me. I need to be more like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause and, le- it, there is that ideal, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So you're coming up against an ideal, something that's idealized within the church culture. Yeah. Yeah. Some, something that Stephen Hassan, the, the world cult expert, mm-hmm. really made clear to me when I was here, he had the benefit of having an identity mm-hmm. as a sec, being raised secular Jew mm-hmm. and then joining a cult, the Moonies, yeah. and, and then leaving it and being able to really internalize this idea of your personality and then the cult personality. And, you know, we don't call Mormonism a cult on Mormon stories. We call it a high demand religion. But either way, the organization's job is to work, do everything it can to get you to assume the personality that it wants you to have that's most beneficial for the organization. Mm -hmm. And the organization believes it's also most beneficial for you to assume the organization's personality. Right. But but what we don't get as someone born and raised in the church, we don't ever get the chance to develop our own personality, yeah. really, um, or we're always beating it back. So right. in your case, your parents did their best to help you nurture your own personality, mm-hmm. But because you were in the Mormon context and then at BYU or going on right. a mission, yeah. you know, just kiss it goodbye. Right. The whole game, whether it's mission or BYU, is to indoctrinate you into the org- the, the personality that the organization wants you to have right. and to pack down whatever authentic personality is really down there. That's the whole yeah. game. Yeah. And I don't think it's intentionally nefarious. But it ends up it being nefarious for certain personality types. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so well said. Yeah. And it's like a false, it's a false self that was created by an outside entity. Right. For you. Right. For the for the organization's benefit. benefit right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. Which is important. Yeah. yeah. Like I think even doesn't Stephen Hassan talk about it as sort of a dissociative state. It disconnects you actually. Yeah. From yourself, which is why, uh, anyway, this is an aside, but upon yeah. leaving. No, that's the whole theme of this yeah, part one. Yeah, upon leaving, <laughs> yeah, so many yeah. people are like, I feel lost. I have no idea what I want. I have no right. idea what I desire Who or long I? for. And it's yeah. like, yeah, that's how that works. Yeah, how well, many it's... how many ex-Mormon women in their 20s or 30s or 40s are like, I don't even know right. who I am. I don't right. even know where to start, you right. know? Yeah. Well, and I'm sure that all of that was part of it too, in terms of wanting to, to stay with the Mormon plan, you know, by the, you know, I'm... I'm dating my, you know, now ex-husband and, you know, senior year comes around and I don't remember overtly or consciously thinking, oh crap, I better get married because I'm about to graduate. But that was probably in there too. Mm -hmm. It probably was. People use your one chance to find your your faithful return missionary. Yeah. And so there's a clear path if I go this way and there's a real unknown path if I go this way. Scary. And that's scary. That's a lot scarier than maybe putting up with a relationship dynamic that you kind of know is not quite right, but like maybe it's, maybe it's just me, maybe. And, and any two people, righteous people can make a really good marriage work. So I'm going to go that way. I'm going to go that way. Not maybe it's you for sure. It's your fault if it's not going wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Mormon doesn't, Mormonism doesn't curate you to blame others for your, you know, what's not going wrong. It it curates you to blame yourself. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, you're not by your family, at least I wasn't, you know, and so I didn't have the benefit of, you know, my, my parents kind of raised some concerns like this, some of this doesn't seem super healthy. Like, are you sure that this is maybe right? But then they want to tread lightly too, because mm-hmm. you don't want to, you Great know, that's a, that's a tricky balance. Right. And so, and for them too, they're like, well, you know what? Like, we're not around it all the time though. Like maybe this is just, yeah. you know, snippets that we're seeing that isn't representative of the whole, like, you know, so it becomes hard there too. So because hard. Right. So hard. Yeah. So you got married by so the we end did. of your senior we year? We sure did. Yeah. So, um, yes. Um, summer after graduation, 
um, we we got married and we moved to Chicago. Which temple? Well, the um, Oakland. Oakland. Yeah, Oakland Temple. And um, it's interesting. I actually did. This was another just kind of tamping it down. Like I I had this experience in the temple where I thought to myself, if you go through with this, you're going to end up divorced. Whoa! I did. So your inner voice told you that it did in the temple. Yes. And again, I don't know why, because even many Mormons would have been like, that is the spirit. I need to listen to that. Right. I don't know why I didn't. I don't know why I didn't. Maybe it's because I needed to get my two babies here, (laughs) but I, I didn't listen to it. I, Mm -hmm. I convinced myself it was cold feet and it was hard. Right. I mean, everyone's there and everyone's waiting and people have flown in from out of town and, um, yeah, so, yeah. So that's and that's real. Mm-hmm. I think it you sure can't. Is. Yeah, yeah. And and I do think when those moments where again your voice takes you off plan. Yeah, I, I just there's not a lot of incentive for that. Right, right. And it's hard. I don't want to make this. You know, I don't know. It's hard. I'm sure my ex agrees at this point that we probably weren't a good match either. But it, it's just yeah. it's hard. It's hard. Um, How old were you? I was 22. So you were 22. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually older by Mormon standards for marriage, (laughs) but for the rest of the world, quite young. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But the most important theme is you were just tamping down your inner voice. Yeah, that's right. Not listening to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the temple too. Like we haven't talked about the temple experience yet. That was uncomfortable. Whatever you want to say. Yeah. So I I had heard enough. um, I don't know how, but I had heard enough that I knew... um, I knew that women veiled their faces. And at the time, this was before, I know that they've recently changed this, but um, at the time you covenanted to obey your husband. And I did not like that. Well, your husband covenanted to To obey obey God. God. Right. So you're obeying your husband, your husband's obeying God. Right. And I didn't like that. And I talked to a bishop, I talked to my bishop about it. And I've always had very good bishops. Um, I was very lucky in that regard. And I remember talking to my bishop about it beforehand and saying, I don't, I don't like that. Like, I don't, feel like that's okay. That doesn't feel, that feels sexist to me. Like, I don't like, you know, I don't like how that feels like, because the only reference I had for why women veil faces was, um, is it the new Testament where Paul's talking about how women can't stand the being in the side of, in the presence of God. And so they have to veil their faces or something like that. I don't know. The whatever exact scripture. it is, it's nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it is. That's not great. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that's, what's in my head as far as why we veil faces. I and mean, so, Paul says women should stay silent in the church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which basically puts women down a notch. Right, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I remember talking about that beforehand, but just, I get again, and having a very understanding Bishop and being like, I understand. I don't love that either, but this, <laughs> you know, don't let it kind of ruin the whole experience type of thing. So, okay. Sometimes understanding bishops can be nefarious because mm-hmm. if a bishop is a jerk, yeah. maybe that would shock you right. into making mm-hmm. a different decision. That's a good point. But, yeah. if the, but if the bishop's like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry, that's hard. Let me validate you and right. now go do the thing that you're supposed to do for the organization. Yeah. That might that's lull true. you. And obviously very well-meaning, like, <laughs> of like course. he's just a good guy, right? That's so the like trick. That's, that's the rub. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um yeah. So yeah, I d- and I did. I went through. I went through anyway. And then, of course, it's hard because anytime you're going through, in general, it's because you're either about to go on a mission and you already have papers in, yeah. or it's because you're about to get married and invitations That's have right. already been sent. And so, pressureful. It, it's very pressureful, right? And that is very hard. Like, what are you going to do? Like, be in there, say no, I actually don't want this, and know that your entire life is about to be turned upside down in a second. Mm-hmm. Like, that's you're not going to do that. And, and uh, the public shame yes. element. Right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was, I've never, I never have enjoyed the temple. Um, it always felt uncomfortable to me. And I know that there are people who, who love it and, you know, and that's great if, if you find peace there, but it's, it was always something that I always felt uncomfortable with it. Um, and I never liked that, particularly that part of it, the veiling and the, the stuff that I think they don't do anymore. But, um. But yeah, I never liked that. It was always very uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah. And I was bugged that like I couldn't know his name, but he could know mine. Like that, like just all of the sexist elements were what were difficult for me. I didn't like that at all. And just this whole structure that it's your husband that brings you mm-hmm. into the celestial right. kingdom. Right. And that if he forgets your name, you don't get to come. Yeah. But he's your He's your entry point. Mm-hmm. Isn't that the message that's being sent? That's the message I got. Yeah. 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 
It's very symbolic. Right. But very real. And yeah, like people can, I think that there are people who are really good at reframing messages that they hear like that. Um, but I, I mean, should we have to reframe things all the time? Like, should that, I don't know. I think the people can reframe it and and have it be a wonderful experience for them. And that's fine. It, it was, it was not comfortable for me ever really to go. You've addressed this, but, but maybe just address it again. Like a modern Mormon apologist would go, Oh, all that stuff's taken out of the temple. So it's okay mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. But what is that? How does it feel to have gone through it and then know that it's been taken out? Right. Does that make you feel better? No, Why not, not at all. Why doesn't it solve all the problems? Not at all. Because for one thing, all of the damage was already done. Whatever damage that does to people has already been done. And it also just adds to the confusion because I thought, at least I was taught that this was given by God. And why is it changing then? Why And why is it changing without really an explanation or without a, I don't know, apology, I guess, <laughs> like not apology, but just acknowledgement, acknowledgement, exactly. Just an acknowledgement, at least that, you know what, we were kind of doing things based on, it doesn't change the symbolism of it, but this, we were kind of doing it without thinking about the implications of how that makes it sound. And that's, that's not right. And we know now how that sounds. And so we're going to do better, right? Like it, there's no acknowledgement like that at all. Mm -hmm. And so it does just make it confusing. And then it makes it annoying because you find out things later and it's like, people wouldn't even believe you. Like, does the generation today even believe that we used to have mm -hmm. to do that? Or do they think that you're making stuff up because you're anti-Mormon now? <laughs> right. Like that's really frustrating. Yeah. yeah. I remember learning, um, and this is a little bit later, I guess, when we get to kind of my faith crisis part, but I remember watching um, the documentary that PBS did on the Mormons. And that is where I learned that, uh, that they used to do deathos in the temple. I did not know that. And I called my mom to confirm it and, and I was blown away. But there are people who don't believe that. Like I'll see it in like online comments or something and someone says that and they literally don't believe it and they act like the person's making it up to be an, to just be against the church. And so that's really frustrating. Like, I don't know. Just, yeah, the lack of acknowledgement, I think, when changes are made is frustrating. They just try to pretend like it's always been like that. So well, I don't know what your problem is. Yeah. Yeah. I think that acknowledgement piece, what it does communicate is what you experienced mm -hmm. was real. Yes. But until you have that, you have this sense of like the system messing with reality. Yes. In a way that makes you feel like, am I crazy? Right. Like, did I experience yeah. what I experienced? Yes. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's why, you know, a lot of people, I, I really hate when when people are like, well, why can't you just not, I haven't actually had this said to me personally, but like the idea of, well, if you don't, if you don't like it and it's not for you, that's fine. But then why don't you just leave it alone? Well, because we spent years without this acknowledgement. And now there's a whole group of people that acknowledges and says, yes, that did happen. You are not wrong. That happened to me too. I felt like that too. Mm -hmm. Like that is real. That is valid. The validation is really important because I do think in Mormonism, unless you do just happen to line up on every single thing, you go without validation a lot. Yeah. And it is, it makes all the difference when you can have some validation and acknowledgement yeah. of what's going on. That's right. Cause there is no, there is no even hope or possibility of accountability. Right. Without acknowledgement. Right. And so when you were, when you apply that, I think too, to this idea of personal relationships, like you were saying. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Then that dynamic can live on in and these personal does. relationships. And it no does. acknowledgement. Right. Which makes accountability. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I that makes that. it really hard too. And that's not always a great way to start off your marriage, right? No. <laughs> With a super patriarchal, awkward, clumsy, uncomfortable yeah. ritual yeah. that's supposed to be the happiest, most meaningful spiritual moment of your life. Yeah. And I'm sure for some people it is, but it, it was not for me. Yeah. 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 It was not for me. Yeah. It was uncomfortable. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So we moved to Chicago, um, lived in Chicago for five years total. After three years, um, our first son was born. And I loved Chicago, by the way. Chicago is such a great place. It's such a great city. It's a really interesting, it's a really fun ward. Loved my ward there. Um, what part? Right in the city. 
Chicago, oh. like right, mm, like wow. the first two years we lived right downtown, like right on, um, like a block from Michigan Avenue. Fun. Yeah, it was really fun. And then um, for the next three years, we lived in a neighborhood called Wicker Park, which is um, pretty, fairly close to like the Cubs Stadium, it's like the kind of the neighborhood next to that. So it was a really fun neighborhood. It was a really fun ward. A lot of really young couples um, living there, and then a lot of kind of inner city converts living there. So it was a really interesting mix. We all had really big jobs because we were like the ones who knew what was going on. We were the ones who'd been raised in the church and kind of knew, I mean, not knew, but at least knew more. Um, So we all had really big jobs. I was in the primary presidency. Um, My husband was in the young men's presidency. And I think our bishop was like in his thirties, like he had young kids. Like it was just that type of ward where, we all just did all the big jobs. What if there's the same ward Rachel Weaver was raised in? She it's one of the black menaces that we had on recently. Did it cover South Chicago? No, it probably was not okay. that ward. Okay. No, okay. Mm-mm. mine was more like more the north, okay. the north side. Yeah. Okay. So it, it, I'm sure it wasn't her ward. Mark and I lived in side. Chicago many years. Oh, you did? We loved a lot about it. Where yeah. did you Our, live? We lived in Naperville. Oh, yeah. Okay. I worked for Arthur Anderson downtown. So did I. A county firm. Oh, yeah, 69 Arthur Anderson. West Washington. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. I were I, well. We were on West Monroe when I mm-hmm. when I worked for Anderson, but I worked for Anderson for nine months before Enron happened. Yeah, and yeah, so I had left Arthur Anderson by then. Yeah, so, so then I moved over to Deloitte and Touche mm-hmm. and lit, worked for them for a couple of years before Noah was born. Okay. Yeah. So and they were in the Prudential Building. We loved a lot about Washington, about Chicago. Oh, Chicago is yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Except the weather. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then you go to Houston. Wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't lived in the best weather places. I grew up in a weather place, which is unfortunate because then it like made me a weather baby. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm only comfortable in like a 10 degree window. Span. <laughs> yeah. Now tell me this is true for you, but w- in spite of that awful quote that any two worthy Mormons can make a marriage work, one thing that is also true is that if you get on that Mormon train of having young kids, serving your callings and building your career and building your early life, that busyness can mask a lot of dysfunction and unhealth. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely true. Yes. And it's not going to be bad all the time, right? I mean, otherwise people know to leave. People know to leave bad situations if they're bad all the time. Yeah. Um, so no, it's not like we never had any good times. Um, but yeah, it just it wasn't healthy um, in general, I would say, and from the beginning, I would say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of times, especially those Chicago years, I would agree with that. I think that that was masked a lot, and I think that we made some progress too, um, and enough so that it made me feel it made me feel hopeful that we would find our way. And so I didn't necessarily want to put off having our family for too long because I did feel confident that we would find our way. Like, we'll just keep working on it. It'll be okay. And eventually, and so then I don't want to, you know, not have our kids because I want to have four kids. And so I don't want to be an old mom and, you know, all of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. So all of that, you know, was in play. And And the church, this is what's hard is the Mormon church has done studies. They know That if they can get you on missions, get you to BYU, get you married young, and get you having kids young. Mm -hmm. Close together. Mm -hmm. And close together. All those pressures are going to make it, number one, make you bonded to the church more and probably make it more difficult for you to ever Mm -hmm. consider that maybe you made a wrong decision. Right. Because how are you going to question your husband, let alone the church, if now kids are in the mix? Right. And so that seals... You to your husband and your into your marriage and to your kids and right. to the church because of all those commitments right. that get laid on top of each other. Yeah, that, all of that's very true, and, and that's a conscious decision yeah. by the church. Right, not necessarily nefarious, mm-hmm. but but they know that that leads to people right. feeling stuck or committed. Well, and I can remember us reading a book together, um, because I don't think it was, and of course I don't want to speak for him, but. I think, and I might be wrong, but I, I think that he recognized too, that we maybe weren't the best match. It maybe it, it certainly wasn't an easy compatibility for sure. And um, I feel like at one point I remember reading a book together on the importance of working on your marriage and how, 
and how even if kids aren't involved, that doesn't make like a lot. I remember the book saying people think you should stay together, especially if you have kids. But even if you don't have kids, you don't want to get divorced. Like it's not. So it was very much programmed into me that, okay, like we're not going to get divorced. This isn't like, I know, I know it's not really working, but, but we're not going to get divorced. And so if I know we're not going to get divorced anyways, we're just going to keep working on it. Then I don't need to put off having Mm kids, having our family too, you know? So I don't know it, you, you hear these messages that kind of, and of course you're looking for reasons to confirm the decisions you've already made. Right. Right. Because you want to feel good about the decisions you've made. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So yeah, all of that was kind of in play as well. How many total years were you married to your first husband? Um, eight years. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was seven when, eight by the time the divorce was finalized. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Long so time. this is the tricky part. How do you talk about what didn't work in the unraveling in a way that is still, yeah. you know. It's hard. And I, and I think I probably don't want to go too much into that. Oh, yeah, just so I that mean. it's not, is, yeah. So what do you want to say? Maybe just to say that it was it was definitely an unhealthy relationship dynamic. Um, and things that I didn't, I didn't recognize as, as not okay that Mm -hmm. I kind of later, as I got a little bit older and as I had more experience in life, just in general. And I mean, I was 22 when we got married. So as I started, um, getting a little bit more mature myself, I think just recognizing things that weren't healthy about the dynamic and things that were really not sustainable for a healthy, for a healthy relationship. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Like in general, I'm pretty vulnerable and I'm going to be annoyingly vague about that just so that I know we appreciate boundaries. Yeah. 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 And I'm imagining, and you don't have to comment on this, but the system that is Mormonism and Mormon patriarchy and the Mormon conceptions of God Mm -hmm. and authority, uh, and the woman's role and the men's role, all that probably replicates itself yeah. into the system that becomes your nuclear family, correct? Yeah. I mean, in in, in some ways more than others, like certain aspects of mm-hmm. patriarchy was definitely in place and certain aspects I don't think was as much. Like it's not, and again, so much of it was, was were subtle things that kind of came into play that, I don't know, it's, sorry, I know I'm being super vague. Um, But yeah, there were a lot of, I think, messaging, a lot of things that were unhealthy about my marriage that I did eventually start recognizing in the church as well. Um, Yeah. And yeah, I can see, we kind of talked about some of it a little bit, like a lack of acknowledgement, accountability, that type of thing. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I, I did start seeing a lot of parallels um, yeah. and uh, in a lot of ways that not everybody does. And it also made me feel like I was going to lose every argument I tried to have because there was going to be a conference talk here that would stop it or a general authority quote there that would stop it. And of course, not everybody does that. And of course, people can use words to their own purposes. But the fact is those words are there. Yeah. And so there was a lot of kind of that going on. Um, yeah. That, yeah. And then ultimately, I think it's just comes down to, we just weren't right for each other. Um, and probably never should have been married to begin with. Yeah. Except again, with that caveat that I'm going to keep coming back to because I just adore my boys and I would never do anything that, you yeah. know, takes them out of the equation. But yeah. 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 Super yeah. grateful for it for, for my kid's sake. But yeah. Yeah. So then you, it's not like the church prepared you to strike out in your own and to have a fantastic career. And this is something Margie has just continually impressed upon me. Once you've had those kids, you're committed to them, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. as, as a mom. Right. And so you're going to want to do all the mom things. Right. So what do you do as a Mormon woman when you're realizing with kids that you're realizing the marriage just right. isn't going to work. Yeah. And I don't live by family. And so, you know, that's a thing too. Like that, that's hard too. So, yeah. So how did you experience and or manage that to whatever um, you want to say or don't want to say? How did I manage kind of having those feelings of realizing, knowing it wasn't really working? But Yeah. Was there a point where you realized yeah, this just wasn't going to work? Yeah. And it, that point really came, um, you know, we struggled kind of from the beginning. Um, 
but it really, it really came, became a, a dire struggle, I would say, once we moved to Texas. Um, that was a real turning point in our mm-hmm. marriage. Um, we moved to Texas when our second child was a newborn. Okay. Um, so we had two kids and I had always wanted the kind of the plan had been, let's do, let's have an adventure for a couple of years in Chicago. And then I wanted to move to California. I wanted to live by my family. Um, and that was what I thought the plan was. Um, he ended up getting a job in Texas where he's from. And, um, I was so desperately trying to make this marriage work. And so I, you know, bloom where you're planted type thing Mm -hmm. that, okay, let's go to Texas. And so we moved down to Texas and I don't know why that was such a turning point, but it really was like it, it imploded pretty quickly once we moved to Texas. And I think, um, you know, within three years we were divorced. Mm. So, um, yeah, Chicago was, there were definitely struggles there too, but it was, and maybe just because of, you know, other things that were masking it. But yeah, it was, it really went downhill quickly once we moved to Texas. Mm-hmm. So, And what clear. are you, if anything, are you able to share about what it's like for a Mormon woman who's had children and is still relatively young and has not been able to really pursue the education or career that they wanted mm-hmm. to now be facing divorce? What can... It's what scary. can you share about that? It's scary. It's um, it's really, it's daunting because, you know, I did have, at least fortunately, I had three years of experience working for big, for big five accounting firms. Which is rare. Which is, which is great because to this day, that's something that headhunters will call me that they saw my resume because of that. Like, so I reckon like that was very, very lucky. Um, but you did that in spite of the culture. I did. Well, yeah, I did. Um, but it was also like recruiting came out to BYU. And so it was also, once you're in the accounting program, that stuff kind of falls, kind of follows naturally. So, um, I do feel very fortunate for that. And I am glad that at least if I didn't, if I didn't pursue what I was maybe a field that I was maybe passionate in, I am glad that I pursued a field that was very marketable. Yeah. Um, I do think that that was very good. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have, that has really been to my benefit. So I am grateful for that. Um, but yeah, it is daunting. I knew I was going to be basically starting from the beginning. I had a five year break on my resume. So I did, I was able to get a job pretty quickly, um, because of what was on my resume, but you know, it was an entry level type you know, anal- accounting analyst role. Um, but I am grateful for it because I was, um, I was able to support my boys. Yeah. I, w- I was able to do it as a single mom. I was able to buy my own home. I was able to do, yeah. and living in Texas was helpful for that too, for as much as I would love to be in California, like Cheap as a estate. single mom, I was able, yeah, I was mm-hmm. able to raise the boys as a single mom, um, which I'm grateful for. Um, I was able to provide for them. Um, But yeah, like I was very cognizant that had I done this a different way, I would not be starting at the bottom. I wouldn't, you know, the people that I started with at, you know, Anderson and then Deloitte were, they were controllers by that point. Yeah. You know, and I was a first year analyst. Yeah. So that was a bummer to realize that. Yeah. And they were great moms, by the way, (laughs) right? Like they were great working moms Mm -hmm. and I could see that they loved their kids and I could see, that's when I kind of started seeing this. Oh man, like maybe it wasn't, maybe we didn't all have to be stay at home moms in order to be good moms. Like maybe that actually was not true. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be, that's great. And there's nothing like I have nothing against that at all. And I loved my years as a stay at home mom, but it doesn't mean that you're not, it doesn't make you a superior mom. And yeah, it's not like they sat all the Mormon young women down and said, there's two very viable paths. Mm -hmm. Well, three. Right. One is, you could be a stay-at-home mom. Right. And that's a great path. Second is you could be a working mom. And that's a great path. Right. And the third is you could not be a mom at all. Right. And that's a great path too. Right. And all of those, w- those know, are paths not can work. Seen equally at all. And, and that is not what your experience was. No. 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 And and it did become very apparent. And it was and it was somewhat confusing to be looking at people that I knew. And then once I started, once I did go back to work, I was so riddled with guilt. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. That first summer, mm. I I cried every single day on my way to work. Mm. Every day. I would drop the kids off at daycare and I cried the whole way to work all summer. And 
like it makes me so angry that I had to that 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 was put on me. Yeah. Because there was no reason for it. My kids are great. <laughs> they are they were not harmed by being in daycare. They were not like it wasn't a bad situation for them. I felt so guilty. Um and I remember going to uh a feeling judgment for it too. And not from everybody. A lot of people are reasonable and wonderful, but, but feeling enough judgment of it that, um, it was hard. And I remember going to, um, a little soccer game for my three-year-old and he's playing soccer with the other little toddlers. And I'm talking to another mom. And this was with the ward. I had actually stopped attending at this point, but I was still taking him to the ward soccer thing. And, um, I was just kind of chit-chatting with her and her son was about to start kindergarten. And I said, oh, you know, that's great. Like, is your son, you know, is is he excited for kindergarten? Has he ever done any kind of preschool before? Or will this kind of be new for him? And she goes, oh, no, he's never done preschool. I just wanted him to be a kid for as long as possible. Like knowing that I have my kids in full-time daycare and I just let it go. And I was just like, okay, but in my head, I'm like, I'm not sending my kid to a sweatshop. Like, what do you think they do at preschool? Like they play all day. <laughs> like, like this is not him not being able to be a kid because That's he right. goes to the daycare or because he goes to preschool. Like, <laughs> yeah. but the, but that thought was that somehow you are making them grow up faster than they should just for putting them in preschool. Like that's mm-hmm. ridiculous. And so it's like, I would hear comments like that. I would, I would remember these talks that I had heard growing up and that I would, you would still hear in general conference, maybe in a little bit of a softer way, but the implication is still very much there. And even as much as the, the great talks about valuing motherhood, even those still felt a little bit like there was an undertone. Mm -hmm. A little manipulative. Yes. A Mm -hmm. little manipulative. And I don't know. And not, not everybody, I guess, internalizes it the same way. I absolutely acknowledge that I am a people pleaser. I am an overthinker. Like I internalize things. I, I acknowledge that, but I'm not getting it from nowhere. And, and it does go someplace. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like there, so there was a lot of that. And once I started working and over time realized that my kids were fine, like they were good. I stopped maybe feeling a little, I stopped feeling as guilty and not all of it comes from the church either. I think working moms everywhere feel mm-hmm. guilt and yeah, stay at home cultural, moms feel guilt. We definitely have a cultural yes, layer Yes, it's for well. sure a cultural, a cultural problem in general mm-hmm. as well. I absolutely agree with that, but it's kind of taken to the next level yeah. When you've been taught that God says to do this, God says this is your role, God says this is what is ordained for you, right? And this one way is optimal. Yes, and this, this is one way one is optimal. optimal and way. maybe you can get a, maybe you can work if you have to because you get divorced or because your husband dies, but ultimately you shouldn't be, except yeah. in those situations, right? And again, I don't know, it doesn't seem like my nieces are feel as much that way. And so I think maybe this new generation is not getting that as much. I don't Mm -hmm. know. I'm sure that I'm sure it probably depends on where you are, but I mean, we sure got it. Yeah. And I don't know. And, and I think it's bad on both sides because then I think it puts, I think it ends up putting working moms on the defensive for obvious reasons, because you're being told that you're, that your kids are suffering if you're not at home with them. So they're on the defensive. And so then I think maybe there gets to be overreactions because they're defensive. And so then I also remember kind of apparently getting in on both sides. I remember a friend of mine who did work when I was staying at home with my kids telling me I was flushing my brains down the toilet. Well, that's rude too, right? Like that's not okay. And no, I wasn't. And she's, we've laughed about that now. And she actually ironically is a stay at home mom now herself. But like, so we've laughed about that. And she acknowledges that that was a dumb thing to say. But I can see why stay at home moms are also defensive, right? Like everyone needs to just stop telling everyone what to do is the point. (laughs) So I don't know. There was a lot of that kind of struggle. Part of what's frustrating about all of this, it reminds me my conditioning that was most uh, disturbing in my mind when I was contemplating leaving the church was the conditioning that you can't raise healthy kids who aren't Mormon. So in my mind, it's like, well, I can't leave the church even if I don't believe it anymore because my kids will be inferior. Right. And that's just, not only is it abusive, it's it's objectively wrong. There are millions and millions of kids raised all over the world outside of Mormonism that are 
as or more brilliant yeah. and moral and ethical as yeah. Mormons. So it's just objectively wrong. Right. And it's similar about kids who go to daycare mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever, or who have working moms. Sometimes it's better for your immunity system to mm -hmm. have exposure to other kids. It's sometimes it's better for socialization. Sometimes it's just you learn independence. You right. learn psychological coping skills. You don't have such yeah. such emotional psychological dependence. You right. know, like there are real benefits, and of course there can be bad things that can happen. But there can be bad things that happen for kids who are raised with right. stay at home moms. Right. So, like, it's just objectively yeah. untrue right. that a kid has an inferior experience right. going to daycare or having a, a working mom in the home. It's just right. objectively untrue. And sometimes the opposite is true. Yeah. And, and that's what's maddening. And it, 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 just does, <clears throat> it just depends on the situation, right? Like, you have, I have, and I, what I've learned is that that is not the, that is not makes, sorry, I'm fumbling over my words. Whether you work or not, is not what makes you the good mom. Mm -hmm. I have known, and I do know, wonderful moms who are stay-at-home moms, and they are the best moms I know. I put my all my sisters in that category. I, so many of my friends, like my, all my friends I put in that category. They are wonderful moms, and they are stay-at-home moms. But I also know wonderful moms who are working moms. And that was very helpful for me when I did start working and I started becoming friends with other working moms and I saw how fantastic they were and I saw how great their kids were and I saw how bonded they were to their kids. And I saw that they just bent over backwards for their kids and all of these things. That was very helpful for me to see. Cause it's like, I knew, like, I would never have said out loud, like, oh, I think working moms aren't as good of moms, but that was definitely the messaging that you kind of got subconsciously and to have that just totally dispelled for me was really helpful and it really helped me eventually start letting go of some of that guilt but it sure took a long time and now it's great because I'm I actually have the experience where I have teenage boys that I did stay home with for the first several years and I have a I now have a two and a half year old and I've always worked with him and I so now I have the kind of rare direct comparison mm, yeah and I see I am like exactly bonded to, I am bonded so much to all of them. Like there is no difference in the amount of bonding, the amount of love, the, like how well I think they're doing. Yeah. So that's been healing as well to see that. And I yeah. think it's just quickly worth noting that the flip side is also true that there are horrendous stay at home moms. Yes. And sometimes yes. when they're quote horrendous, it's because they were never made. Their personalities right. were not made Wasn't a match. to yes. be stay at home mm -hmm. moms. Yes. And so they're not the mom they could be to their kids because they're in a role they were never yeah. fit yes. to, to fill. Right. I think that's and absolutely yet, true If you too. flip them and made them working moms, they might become better moms yeah. because that's how they're wired. Is that, am, is that outrageous? No, I think that that's true. And I think the other side works too. Like, right? Like, I just think you have great moms on both sides and you have crappy moms on both sides. Yeah. It's just not what makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. I also think it's helpful to get outside the role thing. Right. And I think mm -hmm. you spoke to this a little bit earlier, Amy, about just what happens in when you are partnered. What happens when you're able to have a conversation where it's like, okay, now we have a child and here are all the responsibilities mm -hmm. and things we need to do and What's, what's yeah. your desire and what's your personality like right. and who, ha, like, how do we want to do this? And it's like this creative bonding mm -hmm. endeavor mm -hmm. as opposed to like, well, you're the woman. So yeah. if you're, if you're a working woman, then it's daycare. And cause yeah. the, the assumption is, is that if you're, you know, anyway, I just feel yeah. like the, the gendered role kind of part of this, it doesn't help anyone. No. It doesn't. And it's not church specific. That happens, yep. you know, in That's society at large really, too. And yeah. it's, I think that we're starting to get away from that and we're starting to at least work on that as a society. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a real struggle. One of my best friends that I have now is um, a woman that we bonded over this exact issue and our, our sons were, were best friends and they actually met through after school care, at the elementary school. So that's been a big blessing in my life. Cause that's how I met one of my best friends. And she and I would 
call each other on our commutes home and we would we would commiserate about the stresses that are coming with all of this and the you know we would kind of bonded over all of this yeah. and it's funny she actually has an experience she had all of this working mom guilt too and she's never been part of the church so it, it is a societal problem um she had all of this working mom guilt as well and she recently her her two are grown now and she asked her daughter if she ever felt badly that she worked that she wasn't a stay-at-home mom and her daughter goes you worked while I was growing up? Like she didn't even like realize that. Like it was just <laughs> not even on her radar. And it was just funny. We just laughed about it. Like all, like what a waste, like all of that wasted guilt that we, that we, we had and the kids were mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. And I asked that of my son recently too. Like, did that ever kind of bum you out? And he was like, mom, like, no, like that. It was totally fine. Yeah. Really quickly as we're kind of wrapping up this part one, what about divorce guilt? And there's just general social divorce guilt, but then there's Mormon divorce guilt Mm -hmm. because in Mormonism, the stakes of Mm -hmm. eternal families are so much higher. Yeah. You want to talk about that at all? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm a people pleaser by nature and I'm trying very hard to work on that. And I think I've made big, big strides. Um, but yeah, if you want a crash course in developing a thick skin, you should leave the church and get divorced at the same time. That's that's really going to do it. And, and be, be a woman. And yeah, that's really going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> be a working mom. Yeah. Exactly. So I was very, I very much had to work on changing my perspective and on developing, learning what boundaries were and, and all of that. Because um, what was the Mormon perspective that you were battling? The voices in your head, what were well, they saying? Well, it's, it, you know, I was actually out of the church at that point. So we didn't really talk about the that kind of part yet. Um, but at that point, so I wasn't so as much. you had much, lost your faith yes, prior to your prior divorce. Prior to the divorce. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that really quick? Sure. Um, yeah. So I call it the great shelf break of 2008. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, I think, have things on their shelves that they kind of build up over time. Um, I definitely had a big shelf. And 2008, for whatever reason, I felt like, and maybe it was just because I was in a place where I was like kind of recognizing things now, but I feel like that was a real, like things in the church just kept happening over and over again that I just kept adding to my shelf. So, you know, kind of what was on there prior to that polygamy, certainly, um, you know, these kind of incongruities that I was noticing growing up and at BYU and things like Mm -hmm. that. But then I moved to Texas in 2006 and in 2007, the FLDS raid happened in West Texas. Mm -hmm. And I was glued to that. I was so interested in the news on that. And um, I started kind of researching the FLDS church and I learned that their first prophet after the common prophet that they share with the mainstream LDS church was a man named um, John Woolley. And I have Woolies in my family. So I called my dad and I was like, um, is this the same Woolley family? <laughs> And he said, well, yes, like his father is a, is also from our line. So it's like a different brother. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because it was very jarring to me. It made me feel like that could very easily have been me. Mm -hmm. If only my ancestor had gone his brother's route rather than the mainstream route, that could have been me. And I was so interested in this, in this, case and what was happening in this Texas raid. So, and it was making me feel all kinds of things. And of course, bringing back all of the issues I have with polygamy. And I was hearing all of the, you know, defensiveness on the part of mainstream Mormons and trying so hard to distance themselves. But I was recognizing the first four prophets are the exact same people. Like we're not that distant. And it's only on this one issue really. And frankly, they're doing it more consistently with what the earliest members of the church were doing. And that was very jarring to me. Um, So I kind of started taking these things off my shelf and looking at them a little bit closer, I think because of this. Then Prop 8 happened Mm -hmm. in California, and I was not supportive at all of the church's stance on that. I've never had an issue with that. I've always had a problem with the fact that it was seen as a problem or as a sin. I've never viewed it that way. So I was very uncomfortable with Prop 8. Um, 
gosh, there were just so many things I feel like that were happening all at that same time. Oh, Mitt Romney was running for president. So if I was reading articles, um, I would kind of read comments in the comment section on these political articles. And a lot of them would go toward Mormonism. That's where I learned about the head in the hat thing with Joseph Smith. And I thought instantly that it was an anti-Mormon lie. And I asked my husband about it and he was like, no, like that's true. And I was like, oh, like you don't think that's weird? Like that's like, you're okay with that. And it was just, I was not okay with that. And I was not okay with the fact that it had never been presented to us like that. Mm -hmm. That actually was even more bothersome to me because that felt deceitful. So I didn't like that. So I kind of started learning all of these things. And then I started, I just started wanting so badly to start looking into some things, but feeling guilty because I didn't want to you're not supposed to really do that. You're not supposed to like look at anti-Mormon sources or any source other than church. Mm. So I'm feeling the struggle. And I had this experience where, you know, this stuff was on my mind all of the time. And I had this experience where I'm getting ready for the day and I'm, I think, blow drying my hair. So I'm like looking at myself in the mirror and I just, I thought to myself, I am 28 years old. I have two kids and a mortgage. I can actually decide whatever I want to read. Oh, and it wow. was this moment where I was, I felt so sick of feeling controlled and manipulated. And like, I was being told what to do in one way or another. I was so sick of all of that. Mm -hmm. And I was done with it. And I just let that guilt of wanting to research go completely. And I was, I decided to start looking into some of these things that had been on my shelf for a long time. And some of these new things that we're adding to my shelf. And I think I mentioned too the PBS documentary, The Mormons. I mentioned that earlier. That was also happened. I watched that during that period. Mm -hmm. There was a documentary on Freemasonry that had nothing to do with Mormonism that I thought was interesting because I had just read The Da Vinci Code. And so I was like interested in that kind of stuff. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to watch this. And I watched it with my mouth open the whole time, even though it didn't say a word about Mormonism, because I recognized all of the similarities between the temple and, mm -hmm. and Freemasonry, which I had never known about before. So I just, there were all of these things happening that were making me so badly want to like examine it more and look into it more. And I finally gave my permission, myself permission to do it. And once I did, I just started learning even more. <laughs> and um, I just, it was kind of the point of no return at that point. Um, so at the time, I, I discovered a website called mormonthink.org, um, which is still here today, but this was 15 years ago. So it was very like rudimentary. All websites were kind of rudimentary then. And at the time, it was arranged like a wagon wheel. And each spoke of the wheel was like a different um, typical issue that like people might have of concern in the church. So one was, you know, Book of Mormon. One was translation process. One was the Book of Abraham. One was one was lying for the Lord, which I was really interested in. Um, so I started going through them one by one, and I I liked this site because it was really important to me to feel like I was researching in as dispassionate a way as I could, and I was really I didn't want to read anything that felt biased. And I liked the way that they constructed this because all it did, you would click on the issue, it would read the kind of critical point of view or the reason people had an issue with this topic. And then it would read the church response to it or the church point of view on it. And I really appreciated that. It would gave no conclusions. It gave no like adjectives to it, no, nothing like that. And so I would painstakingly go through and I would read all of the footnotes. I would cross check everything on the critic side to something I could find on the church's side. I would try to cross reference everything. If I saw something that was a you know, problematic quote from the Journal of Discourses, for example, I wouldn't just assume that that actually did come from the Journal of Discourses. I would actually find it on the BYU site or on the, I would try to find it somewhere else that I knew was church approved to make sure it was all lining up. and. After a while, I stopped doing that because it always did. Like they, it was, they were not saying anything that was not true. And I just, I started going through it and really, in a way it felt so liberating because I was like, okay, like maybe there's a reason some of this stuff hasn't yeah. added up for me. And so I went through, I think by the time I got to the book of Abraham, I was like, okay, like... <laughs> I don't know what else to conclude here. And I 
had another experience where I will actually call it the most spiritual experience I've ever had. Um, I was praying and just thinking about all of this and kind of realizing, but not even wanting to say it out loud to myself in my own bedroom, in my own company, that I don't think I believe the church anymore. And I was scared to say it out loud, even though it was only me in the room. And I finally did. And I said it out loud. I don't think that the church is true. Like, is that okay? And I remember feeling this overwhelming feeling of, Amy, you can choose not to believe it. It's okay. And that was such an epiphany to me because it actually had not occurred to me that I didn't have to believe it. Mm -hmm. And I had tried for years and years to make things okay, to somehow make polygamy okay, to somehow like make the things that I hear that I knew were not true or, or good to make the unhealthy messages that I would hear to make them okay. Like I had, I feel like I had my whole life just tried so hard to make these puzzle pieces fit. And all of a sudden I didn't have to anymore. And I, it was the biggest relief. Mm -hmm. And it's like all at once, I just put all of my cognitive dissonance down and I never picked it up again. And that was, that was just the most formative experience for me. And now I'm so fascinated by Mormon history because it's super fascinating, but also I don't have this emotional gut reaction every time I see something of, oh my gosh, how can this be true? Like, I, I don't have to make it true anymore. I get to be like, oh, this seems really wrong because it was really wrong, mm -hmm. right? I get to have, I get to think that. Mm -hmm. And it's really liberating. Mm -hmm. For me, it was really liberating. Um, I don't know. So that was the year my shelf cracked. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying to remember timeline. I, I was still going to church, so... I don't know how much longer I went. I don't think for very much longer. Um, I know I kind of finished out the year. Actually, on my on my done day, I um, was the musical number in sacrament meeting on the last day I attended. Oh, wow. Yeah, or I accompanied the musical number, something like mm. that. I was involved in the musical number. Yeah. Um, so I was very, I was very in it till the very end. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, and I've kind of reflected on this too, um, I kind of, I wish that I had considered my own voice worthy enough to listen to, to come to that conclusion without having done all of the evidence-based research that I did. But ultimately, like, I had to, I think I had to have that external validation that it was okay to not believe it anymore. Yeah. yeah. When it should have been, it should have been enough that it didn't resonate for various other reasons, right? Yeah. yeah. But for me, it kind of took confirmation through kind of the evidence that I was reading. Yeah. Yeah. So. And you were clear to say that your divorce wasn't really tied to your loss of Mormon faith. I will say that, um, not that it wasn't tied completely. I do think that, I think that they informed each other in certain ways. Um, but I, I, the divorce 100% would have happened either way. Like even if I had stayed faithful, active Mormon, believing Mormon, it absolutely would have happened. The divorce still would have happened. Um, and and did, I believe the loss of faith would have happened as well, either way. And did you talk about, to the extent you were able to talk to your ex-husband about this stuff while it was going um, on? I was not able to. I, I, I tried to a couple of times and it was just very much, um, it, it, it was, the, the conversations were very quickly shut down. Um, I think he just was not, it, it wasn't something he wanted to hear. So yeah, it wasn't something that we talked a lot about. Um, so were you able to talk to anyone or was this very much kind of a lonely? Um, it was somewhat lonely, except that I ended up calling my, it, it was lonely up to this point. Mm -hmm. Once I finally kind of came to my conclusion, I, I called my parents and this again is a tribute to just what great Mormon parents they were that I I didn't feel one second of 
apprehension over calling them. Apprehension maybe a little bit, but I wasn't scared to tell them at all. I knew that I would still be loved. I knew mm-hmm. that I was would still be accepted. I knew that that was not a concern for me, which I know is is not necessarily common. And I'm very, very grateful for that. But when I did, um, it turned out that they had also been on their own faith journey, wow. um, that they hadn't been... They, they knew that I'd had some questions because I had I had called them during that documentary and been like, is this true? Like what? Mm-hmm. And when I would kind of learn certain things, I would be like, I would share things with them. Um, so I had shared a little bit along the way. So they knew that I was looking into things. They knew that I was questioning. And so they purposefully did not tell me that they also were looking into things and questioning because they didn't want to influence, influence my decision mm-hmm. at all. Um, but once I told them that, you know, I... I've come to the realization that I don't, I don't believe the church is true. Like, and I don't, I don't want to continue being active in it. Um, then they shared that they were on the same page, which was also really nice because then I did have people to talk to about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I was just reflecting on your story of your, um, you know, inspired moment where, and I think it's so interesting that, you know, in your own words, you, you kind of spoke about giving yourself the permission or choice to not believe Yeah, that that's, that's kind of what came to you. Yeah. And just thinking about how important that is in a, in a place, in a life story where again, you're, you're kind of born into a conditioning. Yes. You're kind of born into an environment. Kids don't get to choose right. right, their environment, their family culture, some of these larger things. Right. And so that, you know, for that moment, the power of choice. Yeah. You know, how just yes. deeply powerful that is. And it felt very powerful. It felt, it felt um, life-changing, really. Mm-hmm. And and it really did feel like an epiphany. Like it had not occurred to me until then that I didn't have to believe it. Yeah. Like that had not occurred to me. And I was 28. <laughs> and I don't know. I yeah. just, it really did feel like a very powerful, for lack of better terms, answer to prayer. And it it was, I think, I think it was a moment where I was finally listening to my inner voice and acknowledging and and giving myself permission to listen to that inner voice and to be okay with it. And that really was that, yeah, it was that moment. And it was very profound. It felt very profound. Yeah. I, and it reminds me of what you were saying, John, about kind of the, the self, or I think you were talking about it with the way of con- this constructed personality that the organization creates versus kind of your, your self. I'll just refer to it as, as kind of a self. Yeah. And it feels like in that moment, you, it literally was a change in yes. road. Like for years you were feeding the self, the, that conditioned self, mm-hmm. the one that was created for you. Right. And in that moment, it was like this flip where you actually fed the self, you know, yeah. you, your created you know, right. new little self, new little, yes. fl- like, you know, saying, I think I'm, I'm going to go this direction. Yeah. 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 I'm also just, I'm mindful of this counterintuitive dynamic that sometimes we forget as humans that we're always trying to avoid pain because mm-hmm. we, th- we equate mm-hmm. pain with harm or damage But the truth is, sometimes pain leads to growth and not dead, the opposite of damage, which is growth. And so you did a super hard thing that was very painful. You went against the conditioning. You went against the conformity. You went against everything your community and probably family and society was all telling you to do. It was super painful and difficult. And yet, 
instead of leading to damage, it led to incredible enlightenment and right. growth and, and self empowerment. Yeah. And so we we need to not equate pain and difficulty with damage. Right. But instead realize that and of course excessive pain can lead to damage. But the right amount of pain yeah. with a difficult decision can be the secret to incredible growth. Right. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm Makes. grateful every day for it. Like it's. Yeah. And yet it was super hard. It was I super hard. It was. <laughs> it was. Scary and hard. And, and I feel, um, you know, in a way it's, you kind of asked about how the divorce and the leaving the church kind of played in together. In a way, at the time I felt frustrated that both things were happening at the same time because it felt like, it felt like adding insult to injury. Like it was, it was too much pain at one time. And now when I kind of reflect back on it, I think that, I think it was good because my marriage was ending anyways. I knew that it was not, it was not a, it was not a sustainable relationship dynamic at all. And it was ending whether I stayed in the church or not. And so in a way, even though it was a bummer because it kind of handed on a silver platter, this like excuse that externally people kind of believed it was because of that. And it wasn't. Um, so that part was a bummer, but at the same time, it did allow me to be able, it was kind of a good break to, it was happening anyway. So this is when I can leave. I knew it wasn't going to destroy my marriage. My marriage was already gone. It was already in process of imploding. Right. So I didn't have that stressor to worry about. And I know a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, So there were good things about those events coinciding as well. That's interesting. And it also thrust you though, I mean, a different lens too is just the brain and how much it loves familiarity, like how much it will choose what is familiar mm-hmm. over what is new, like how much fear comes up when we're going to do something where we were not familiar. It's different. And you, you were put in a place where you were doing so much that was unfamiliar. Yeah. Yeah. It was overwhelming. Yeah. It was definitely an overwhelming period of time for sure. And that's how growth happens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if it's not too much. Right. Yeah. And that's how you get familiar with who you are on the other side of the things you fear most. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I would say that's true. Hmm. Well, maybe this yeah. is a great point to end part two, part one. Okay. Sure. And then part two will be about what? Will be about raising, raising your kids in a mixed faith non-marriage <laughs> <laughs> and rebuilding a life and rebuilding a life. Yes. After Mormonism yeah. as a single, what, 30 yes. something. Yeah. Single, woman. even 29. Yeah. 28 when 29, mm. I guess. Yeah. And yeah. finding, learning to listen to your voice and follow it yes. for yep. better, for worse. All of that. All That's of part that. two. That's, That's part, part two, two to come. <laughs> well, Amy Lloyd, this has been lovely. I loved part mm-hmm. one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's been really great talking to you guys. And Margie, thank you so much for being here. You're always fantastic. Oh, thank you. I'm glad I'm here. All right, viewers and listeners, thanks for joining us. Uh, if you appreciate this type of content, we, our bread and butter is, uh, you know, your support through uh, the donate button. So please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button, become a monthly donor. And that's how we're able to um, support this work with our staff and all the resources we have. Please share this uh, episode with as many people as possible. Um, we're grateful for all you do. Please follow us on all the social medias. Subscribe on Facebook and on YouTube and on Instagram and TikTok. Follow us there. And always, we appreciate your feedback in the comments of all those platforms, but also uh, over email, mormonstories at gmail.com. And um, yeah, just uh, just come right back for part two because I know it's going to be as good or even better. So thanks again, Amy Lloyd. All right, thank you. All right, uh, see you guys in just a minute. See you soon.